I begin with a meditation on Aristotle's Organon, a task which requires a great deal of interpretive humor. I hesitate to call this an analysis because I very much feel it is impossible to exact the precise meaning of words written in a different aeon in a language dead to all but the most enthusiastic scholars. Even if the organon were translated word for word, my comprehension of those words would be shaped by the paradigms of my own century. My image of Aristotle's character is prone to distortion. I see my ancient elders as inviolable gods and fumbling fools, often blending these traits within the very same caricature. Yet this work is the oldest and most complete summary of the principles of nature observable to everyone by the mere act of possessing the senses. No other laws of nature are so universally acknowledged as true. And so no relation, hypothesis, or theory can be regarded as real without first accepting the fundamental axioms of existence which it lays down. In my limitation, I cannot claim that this is a summary of the organon. This is not a recourse to all of Aristotle's ideas as an immutable truth. This is respect and retrospect for the problems he put forward and for the ultimate idea behind his work, which is to say, to outline the grammar of existence. Categorization is easily definable in the 21st century, where genes and species, genres and specials, generalities and specializations are phrases upon the common breath. The basic idea is that, while real entities are singular, they share similarities with other singular entities, and singulars can be grouped with those similar entities, disregarding any difference between individual entities in order to draw attention to the simple attributes which they share. A species is one individual instance of an entity, a physical singular which is contained within a group. A genus is that group itself. A differentiate is any property of an entity which separates it from all other groups on the preceding level of genus. This very basic structure can fan out horizontally to become more general and vertically to highlight the specific differences to an extent that it is easily imaginable that all existent things may be categorized by their differences and have a place unique to them in the universe. This idea of formal hierarchy has provoked a need for an increasing number of terms to refer to the exact levels and kinds of genus, such as class, kingdom, and folder. The systems of classification are so universal, I doubt there is any entity on Earth which doesn't have some kind of categorization available to it. But why am I so certain categorization is something existentially true? That it is not a convenient language invented purely to describe reality, as an artificial law dependent on my mind and the existence of humans to hold firm. I don't mean how has it arrived within my mind. It can be argued that I am neurologically wired to conserve processing time by abandoning specific details, and I adapt quickly to new situations by grouping them with prior situations. I mean to ask, why did those neurological systems arise to begin with? What motivated me to believe that categories exist? The Organon attempts to solve this issue by highlighting the difference between existence and reality, which is to say, existence is what is there to be acted on, and we can act on things which are false as much as we can act on things which are true. The story of Othello holds one example. While the affair between Othello's lover Desdemona and his friend Cassio was entirely false, nonetheless, Othello was led to actions which made sense by believing the affair was true. He acted on something which existed, but which only existed within the confines of his mind. A less tragic example may be seen in the invention of the telephone. By the mere fact that it had not been invented, the telephone was not real. Yet Bell conceived of a use for a telephone, acted on a fiction of science, and then set about making it real. This is not to say that there is no difference between truth and existence. Falsehoods can be acted on, but truths can be interacted with. Engaging truths produces a reaction, while engaging falsehoods doesn't. But such examples of falsehoods' existence necessitate the inception of a secondary kind of existence distinct from reality. It is known today by such terms as abstraction and conception. 
The organon puts forward the idea that species are real things so far as the senses can detect, while any genuses containing them are only ever abstract and do not exist in reality. For example, this cat is real, and by observing it I can come up with a number of qualities which define it. It has an average length and height, a weight, a mass, even a time period. The organon would describe the intersection of these categorical attributes in a single entity as a complex form. This cat is also a mammal, but I cannot physically observe multiple complexities combining to define a mammal without annihilating the differences that separate a cat from a mammal. I can observe a cat, which is a species of mammal, but at no point can I observe a mammal without grounding that perception in a physical, real species. The existence of the abstract is predicated on the reality of the subject, in this case, the cat. I have to strip away the cat's length, height, weight, mass, and time period, the singular properties of the cat, in order to hold the abstract notion of a mammal in my mind. From an observational standpoint, the abstract notion of mammal can only be true if every genus between it and the cat is also true. If one genus is not, there is a break in the chain between the cat and the mammal, which can only be mended by recategorization. This is how I determine the truth of abstract things, which are otherwise unobservable in my human fumbling. The organon views abstract categories as simple forms, the building blocks of reality itself. While its own categorizations are often outdated, there is a very important reason for thinking of existence in this same way, as complex first and simplified by method of deduction. As an example of how this works, we can begin with a universal class in which a number of differentiating genuses exist. I'm going to make a single observation of a cat and declare this species as equivocal to my individual cat in the real world. I now need to categorize this species, which means placing it inside of every genus which shares a property with my individual cat. The quick and easy way to do this is to copy and paste, which is to say to replicate the cat and place it in each genus which applies to it. But this is non-representative of reality. I have only one cat, and to create a group of cats from one cat threatens the idea that all cats are exactly alike. An update to my observation of any single cat won't physically carry through to other cats. Thinking it does is a common logical error called generalization, which states that there are no differences between multiple entities. This error is demonstrably disprovable. I can open my fridge and put an apple inside, and then open someone else's fridge and find no apple there. A fridge is different from all other fridges. I have to open fridges to confirm whether there are apples inside of them. All that can ever exist in a fridge is a probability of an apple, not an apple itself. Probability tells me what to look for and where I may find it. It does not diminish my need to consistently look and question to confirm. Instead of generalizing, I have to take the genuses I've identified as true to my cat and find a way to put the one cat inside of all of them. This again proves very simple. I can lump all of the genuses inside one another and place the cat in the very last one. Now I can follow the trail of cat-like properties right down the directory to the species. At the moment the directory is very ordered, and that's because I've only got one species filed in the system. Once I induce more species of entities, the system becomes much more complex. While there is only a single entity in existence, there is total correlation between its properties, which is to say every time something vocal is present, a mammal is present, as is something pointy, and vice versa, all pointy things are mammals, and all mammals are vocal. Once more entities are observed, this absolute correlation breaks down, and assuming relationships between properties becomes much more difficult. In this case, I'll add an observation of a rose. Now, there are a lot of genuses which need to be separated. The rose is not a mammal, and is a kind of non-mammal called a plant, and it needs to fit within the genus of plant while simultaneously keeping in the category of organism. I could create a new organism genus under the plant genus, but just like copying the cat, this isn't representative of reality. Roses and cats don't have different abstract categories of organism. They both experience the same phenomenon of being organic in a different way. In the spirit of exhausting all wrong alternatives before reaching the right one, I can simply shuffle these around until both plants and animals are in a category of things organic, and I can treat plant and animal as genuses for each describing their differences as organisms. 
and I can keep migrating genuses to their differential directories until once again there's a kind of internal stability, given the two observations contained within the system. Note, however, that it is no longer true to say that all things organic are vocal, but it is still true that all things vocal are organic. With the introduction of a differentiate, the directory is now split into universal, major, and minor genuses, which apply their forms to increasingly smaller samples of the total observable material. So let's add another observation, and call it mushroom. A mushroom is an organism and has a weight, but it isn't pointy like the cat and the rose. And just as I'm about to do my old trick and move pointy down to a lower genus, I realize I can't. The very next genus down is one in which there are two differentiated species with sharp points. I can't move the genus up either, because the lower directory has to contain the mushroom, which isn't something pointy. My only option is to split the directory, to categorically sever the notion of pointiness into a separate universal field with no correlates, which meets up with my pre-existing directory on the level of the complex form. This is a crucial point in categorization. Before, the labels I put on the genuses were relatively arbitrary, but the more information, more files in the system, they start to actually define their contents and state the ways in which singulars are different from all other entities. This isn't a one-time event. The more times I add an observation, the greater chance the original directory is going to break down into separate categories with imperfect correlation. A lot of philosophy at the time Organon was written states the opposite, that the specific is dependent on an undeniably true abstract form. And the consequences of this thought plague us today, where people act on formal abstracts before conclusively deducing them through the existence of real species. Or worse, they claim a species is a degenerative violation of an abstract form, rather than having a form being falsified by the existence of a contrary species. From my own experiences, I know that my consciousness has been forged by the impressions left by nature. And so it is observable nature which must be relied upon for all later deductions as to the truth of an abstract world. My body I can prove, not just once, but by passive and continuous observation and prediction. What I call my soul is a matter of faith, ungrounded by an observable species. The proof of abstracts relies on the world of bodily observation, rather than an automatic insistence upon the truths of an external, pure form. Abstracts exist, but their truth or falsehood can only be determined by recourse to observation. This is, really, just an explanation of how I know one of the basic facts of existence, which is that there are abstract forms I can interact with alongside what I call reality. Categorization is mainly of use as a tool. In ancient Greek, what is called an organon, in that it is a theory behind a great chunk of propositional logic, and thus underlies the grammar of the universe. All men are mortal. Mortal is a genus in which one species is man. Aristotle is a man. Man is a genus in which one species is Aristotle. So, Aristotle is a mortal. There is a category of mortals in which there is a genus called man, containing a species named Aristotle. In this syllogism, I can witness how categorization is expressed in language, how its structure is essential to maintaining a clear view of existence, and how, perhaps, the entirety of my complex form may be realized clearly only through a categorical analysis of the world around me.